Welcome, my friends and neighbors, to our annual Black History Month program. My name is Tilly Blanding. Most of you may know that. I am so humbled to be your host this evening, and I pray that you are well and staying safe. We are all blessed to be back here in 2022 to witness another program. Here we are again, another year. We don't get to fellowship with you in person, so it's a bit strange. However, we, the Black History Month Committee, and our wonderful Fairfax County Channel 16 staff have been planning for months to bring you great information and entertainment. Now, you know every year we do our favorite song, and our favorite song is a Negro spiritual. Well, this year I'm going to change it up a little bit because of what we are going through in this uh, Voting Rights Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Right at Rights Act. We know what the Senate just did. So I'm going to change this song up, up a little bit, and we're going to all sing, Hey, no, going to let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't going to let nobody turn me round. Keep on a walking, keep on a marching right into voting land. Sing it with me. I can hear you out there. Now, that was important to me, and it should be to all of us, because we have to stay on the battlefield fighting for voting rights. Read your 15th, 15th Amendment and what it says. We shall overcome. That's how we celebrate, proud of our history. Celebrating Black History Month is a way of remembering important people and important events, as well as the sacrifices, contributions, and achievements of African Americans to the United States of America and the world. This year's theme is past, present, and future. We will take you on a historic journey of Fairfax's African Americans' heritage of enslaved and freed people. Let me pause there for a minute. minute. We were not slaves. We were enslaved. Let that be clear to you. As well as tell you about some exciting programs taking place in our community today, as well as exciting plans for the future. So I want you to sit back, relax, and let us get this show on the road. Up first on the program, a performance from an amazing student that attended the Pine Forge Academy. This private school is only one of four existing African-American boarding academies in the country. Their campus in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, served as a terminal for the Underground Railroad during the closing days of slavery. From that heritage, the school has built a legacy of distinction following its motto that excellent is no accident. We are blessed to have their pre-recorded performance under the musical direction of Jared Roseborough at the Library of Congress. with 
wonderful, wonderful musical director, Jared Roseborough. You are doing a fantastic job with those young people. That was truly an uplifting and soul-stirring version of that old Negro spiritual. Moved my soul. Hope it did yours. This year's Black History program is dedicated to the late Paulette Whiteside. Paulette was a well-known Black History Month supporter and committee member, a Fairfax County employee. Paulette worked for Neighborhood and Community Services. She passed on December 19, 2020. Everyone knew her as a woman who was full of life and exuberance. She gave her all to the things and people she loved. We are all forever grateful for her continued contributions to Fairfax County. The Black History Month Committee, the community, and everyone who knew her. Rest in peace, my sister. You will forever be remembered. You will forever be remembered. Now, the Reverend Dr. Darrell K. White, senior pastor for the Bethlehem Baptist Church in Alexandria, will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far along the way. You, O oh Lord, who have been our father and mother, we bless you on this festive day. We gather to acknowledge your faithfulness to us from our earliest beginnings near the Pishon, the Gion, Euphrates, and Nile, on to the brush arbors and hush arbors, as we followed your leading to settle along the Potomac, James, York, and Rappahannock rivers. We bless you for the wisdom of our elders. We thank you for the rough hands and broad shoulders that built this county and nation. We ask that the rich history we will relive this month will motivate us to do our part in our season. Help us through service to extend the reach of Dr. King's beloved community. This we ask in the name of the one who became the way, showed us the truth, and on a hill called Calvary, offered humanity new life. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Darrell K. White, for that inspiring, uplifting prayer that addressed what we are all going through today. Next, we will hear from our chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, Jeff McKay. Jeff will bring us a few words and read the proclamation. Right after Chairman McKay, you will hear from our own county executive, Brian Hill. Brian Hill is the first African American to hold the position of Fairfax County Executive. I give you Chairman Jeff McKay and County Executive Brian Hill. Hi, I'm Jeff McKay, Chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. I want to thank you for joining us for our annual Black History Month program. In Fairfax County, every day we celebrate our diversity, and I say all the time that it's our diversity that makes us stronger. We can't just say that. We need to show what that means in our actions. Our diverse population advances our economy, provides new opportunities for our students, broadens our cultural awareness, and challenges the status quo of government and the services we provide. This helps us all. During Black History Month, I call on Fairfax County to reflect on how the black community has helped us advance, but also know in Fairfax County our history is not different from the rest of the South. We must always recognize that our history of being home to plantations and slave owners does impact our present. Black History Month serves as a time to acknowledge the systemic and institutional racism that is embedded in our society and to reflect and to learn and to evaluate how we can build a better and more equitable future together. About a year or so ago, I was proud to convene my task force on equity and opportunity. This task force was comprised of over 40 members who were tasked with analyzing the drivers and root causes of inequity in Fairfax County and what stands in the way of our progress towards becoming one Fairfax. That said, because of the work and dedication of this outstanding group, 
they produce 20 recommendations to tackle those root causes. As we speak, our board has already acted on some of those recommendations and is working to implement others. You can read them in full on my website and I would encourage you to. That said, I also have a proclamation to share with you all today. Whereas African American History Month is an opportunity to reflect on the sacrifices and contributions made by generations of African Americans throughout the history of Fairfax County and the United States, and whereas we must continue working to address the persistent inequities and injustices that African Americans continue to face and to acknowledge that past injustices shape our present, and whereas African Americans continue to lead at the highest levels of the military, business, education, law, government, the arts, sports, and religion, and whereas African Americans continue to make significant contributions as entrepreneurs, in public service, and across numerous professional fields, adding vitality to our country, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Fairfax County. And whereas we must be steadfast in our efforts to reach the day when every person is assured their unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, now therefore be it resolved that the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, on behalf of all residents of Fairfax County, does hereby proclaim February 2022 as African American History Month in Fairfax County and urges all residents to join in recognizing the African American community in Fairfax County and throughout the United States and the world. Thank you for having me and sharing Black History Month with our community. Have a safe month and be well. Welcome. As your county executive, I am pleased to once again participate in our annual Black History Month program. As you all know, we are in the midst of yet another year living through a public health crisis, and unfortunately, once again, we can't be together for this event honoring the experiences of the African American communities within Fairfax County. While these past 23 months have been difficult for us all, the African American community continues to endure a disproportionate share of its health impacts here in the United States. Fairfax County, continues to lead the way as we educate, vaccinate, and booster our community at a rate higher than anywhere in the Commonwealth. As you've heard me say, wherever and whenever I can, Fairfax County remains a great place to live, work, and have fun. I, however, remain cognizant of the systemic inequities and disparities in outcomes that continue to exist in Fairfax the Commonwealth, and the country. It is my goal to ensure that Fairfax County remains a place where all people can thrive personally and professionally. This is the vision of One Fairfax. Our focus remains on the physical and mental health of our communities, affordable housing, and economic opportunities for all. The purpose of One Fairfax policy is to ensure that we intentionally consider racial and social equity in county policies programs, and services. It is a declaration that all residents deserve an equitable opportunity to succeed, regardless of their race, color, sex, nationality, sexual orientation, religion, disability, income, or where they live. As we consider our past and present, we must shape our future together. I am privileged to be here today and to reflect on the many contributions made by African Americans individually and collectively, and we will continue our work making Fairfax County a place where all can succeed. Thank you for your time. Please be safe and all the best. For more than 250 years, African Americans have written and recited and published poetry about beauty and injustice, music and muses. In 2021, a year-long project titled Lift Every Voice and Sing was spearheaded by the Library of America in partnership with the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture 
and with libraries, arts organizations, and bookstores in all 50 states. It was also supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and Emerson Collective. And from that project, many poets got together to highlight the richness and diversity of African-American poetic imagination and its central place in American poetry. The poet and poem we want to share from that project is Eve L. Ewing reading her poem, I Saw Emmett Till This Week at the Grocery Store, followed by a message from our longtime supporter at Cox Media, Lynetta Clark. Now, Eve L. Ewing reading her poem, I Saw Emmett Till This Week at the Grocery Store. Hi, this is Eve Ewing, and I'm going to be reading a poem I wrote called I Saw Emmett Till This Week at the Grocery Store. Um, I wrote this poem in 2017 uh, on the anniversary of Emmett Till's murder, and it's inspired by a lot of things, um, one of which is a, a line from a poem by my friend Fatima Oscar in which she says, I wish them only a mundane life. And I got to thinking about um, what a radical demand that is uh, in the face of tremendous violence, the idea that somebody would have the right to just live out a regular, boring life. And I thought about the fact that Emmett Till um, is one of the most famous figures in American history and one of the most impactful figures in, Amer in American history, but it's because he was murdered so unjustly at such a young age. And so this poem imagines an alternate reality in which Emmett Till gets to just grow old and be boring and normal, um, and I run into him at the grocery store. Uh, the poem is also um, very much part of the Afrofuturist strand of my work. A lot of my work is around reimagining time and space and um, kind of fuzzifying the boundaries between time and space as, as we usually understand them. So um, those are some of the themes of the poem, and I hope you enjoy it. I saw Emmett Till this week at the grocery store. Looking over the plums, one by one, lifting each to his eyes and turning it slowly, a little earth, checking the smooth skin for pockmarks and rot or signs of unkind days or people, then sliding them gently into the plastic, whistling softly, reaching with a slim woolen arm into the cart. He first balanced them over the wire before realizing the danger of bruising and lifting them back out, cradling them in the crook of his elbow until something harder could take that bottom space. I knew him from his hat, one of those fine pork pie numbers they used to sell on Roosevelt Road. It had lost its feather, but he had carefully folded a dollar bill and slid it between the ribbon and the felt, and it stood at attention. He wore his money. Upright and strong, he was already to the checkout by the time I caught up with him. I called out his name and he spun like a dancer, candy bar in hand, looked at me quizzically for a moment before remembering my face. He smiled. Well, hello, young lady. Hello, so chilly today. I should have worn my warm coat like you. Yes, so cool for August in Chicago. How are things going for you? Oh, he sighed and put the candy on the belt. It goes. It goes. Thank you so much. That poem is called I Saw Emmett Till This Week at the Grocery Store. You can find it in my second collection of poems, 1919. Hello, I'm Lynette Clark, Director of Field Operations for Cox in Virginia. For more than 20 years, Cox has been a trusted member of this community. As the largest private telecommunications company in America, We've invested more than $16 billion in our nationwide fiber-based network over the last decade. And to be ready for future demands, including bringing 10 gigabit broadband speeds to every home in our service area, we're already planning to invest an additional $10 billion over the next five years. Virginians use our network to call their loved ones, to hold meetings with international colleagues, and to check in with their patients but we're so much more than a broadband service provider. Last year, we awarded $1,000 grants to teachers to update their classrooms 
and some of those heroes of education, as we call them, are from right here in Fairfax County. And I'm so proud to share that our employees donated $90,000 on hashtag Giving Tuesday to local nonprofits through our Cox Charities Grant Program. You see, we're committed to building communities where all people can prosper, and it's all rooted in our investments and connections and equity. In addition to our network investments, we've invested in, created, and increased our digital inclusion products like the Connect to Compete and Connect to Assist, ensuring individuals and families at all levels of the financial spectrum can get connected. As we begin 2022, we look forward to forging new connections, even as we continue to navigate the pandemic, but I'm confident we can do it. Whether it's business as usual or a global event that shakes us to our core, Cox will be here supporting our employees, customers, and communities. The fact is, not only do we have the technology to bring people closer, but we also have a culture that puts people first. We'll continue leading the way, partnering with local organizations and local governments to ensure people stay connected and stay working so that Fairfax County can continue to be a great place to live and work. On behalf of all of our employees in Fairfax County and across the Commonwealth, happy Black History Month. May this month be a time of learning, reflection, and of course, a celebration of Black culture. Thank you. Oh, that was so inspiring. Yes, yes, yes. This, my people, is what Black History Month is all about sharing and inspiring one another. I know everyone is ready for more because I know I am. Thank you, Eve L. Ewing and the Library of America and our longtime sponsor, Lynetta Clark from Cox Media. Just simply wonderful. We next have a young lady who is very graceful, who will do a modern dance performance. In this dance to Leslie Odom Jr.'s standards, we all know Leslie Jr. from Hamilton, Tony Award winning Leslie Odom. Amenica, having worked in front of and behind the camera, is coming full circle in an ode to her ancestors, elders, and all who use their art to inspire and uplift us. In the spirit of solidarity, standards delivers a message of proudly living our culture in truth and harmony. They call me Mr. Tibbs. When it was crumbs, scraps, pennies, packs, everything was fine. You treat me like a loaded gun when I ask for what is mine. Always try to dim my light. Bright I shine, but I've got my standards that I'm never letting die. The big girls are bright and I'm bleeding me dry. Cannot abide. I got my head on a swivel this time. Why would I let you just twist it aside? I catch a fever when they're aiming at the way I live my life. These are my standards. from my throne the truth is i'm demonized standing my own ground so you push me to the deep end hoping i drown but i've got my i got my bim bobby i'm be there anybody want to do that i don't need you
me so unfair Don't I deserve my God-given share Whether I've got a dollar or I'm a billionaire These are my standards Oh, thank you, Aminika. That was truly wonderful, truly lovely. I absolutely enjoyed your performance, as I'm sure everyone out there did. Our next presenter is historian Edwin B. Henderson II. Mr. Henderson is the founder of the Tenor Hill Heritage Foundation, Incorporated, a nonprofit public organization whose mission is to promote awareness of African American history and Northern Virginia's civil rights pioneers in Falls Church. Today I will be presenting to you a presentation for African American History Month entitled Resilience and Resistance, African American History in Fairfax County. Enslavement in Virginia in 1619 issued in the enslavement of Africans in the British colonies in the Americas. The introduction of Africans to the Americas brought our labor, our culture, and most of all, our humanity to these shores. For a while, tobacco brought about many plantations that purchased Africans to clear the land, plant and harvest the crops, and do all manner of manual labor to sustain the colonial economy. But after a while, and the decline of tobacco as America's major cash crop and as cotton became king. The industry of chattel slavery remained a profitable endeavor in Virginia. Virginia became a slave breeding state. The economy of Virginia was bolstered by the selling of black people that were no longer needed to grow tobacco and send them to the cotton fields of Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Texas. Firms like Franklin and Armfield or Price Birch and Company were brokers who sold millions of enslaved people from Virginia to markets in New Orleans or other destinations south to pick cotton. A slave worth, say, 500 here could easily sell for $1,000 there. Looking at the 1860s census, there were over 1,700 free African Americans living in Fairfax County out of a total population of around 13,000. Two to 3,000 enslaved were freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, which denoted that all slaves of states currently in rebellion would be freed, of which, of course, Virginia was a state currently in rebellion, with Richmond being the capital of the Confederacy. During the Civil War, contraband camps were formed on land that Confederate sympathizers, Camp McVeigh, Camp Jackson, Camp Rucker, and Freedman's Village were established to accommodate the masses of freed and escaped enslaved people who made their way to Union lines near Washington, D.C. There were thriving African-American communities in several areas of Fairfax as well, in places like Gum Springs, Ilda, Freedom Hill, Audrick's Corner, Clifton, Centerville, Drainsville, Merrifield, and Falls Church, just to name a few. In these free and freed black communities, one would see a church and a school as the backbone of that community. The black church was the central institution in the community that helped to give black people refuge in a society that was often hostile towards them. Colored schools were important to have where black children could be educated. No one appreciates freedom more than someone who had not been free. And when freedom came, we knew African-American freedom depended on owning land, 
owning one's labor and being able to read, write, and do arithmetic. Some might have called Colonel John S. Crocker a carpetbagger. I prefer to call him a sympathizer. He helped blacks to acquire land by buying land from unwilling whites and then sold that land to blacks at reasonable rates and sometimes on credit in and around Falls Church. One of the things I want to show is a 1878 Hopkins map. Uh, and on this map, you see at the center would be the Falls Church, the Falls Church Episcopal. But all around there, you would see uh, black commerce. Frederick Forrest Foote, Jr. was one of those who owned a store on uh, Leesburg Pike. But there were several others as well, like Harriet Foot Turner, George Bryce, and several others. This is a portrait of Frederick Foote, Jr., who was a cobbler, a grocer, later became, was elected town constable, and then town councilman. His father, Fred Foote, Sr., after emancipation, bought his enslaved master's land and added to it until he owned a total of 40 acres at this important crossroads of Seven Corners. Fred Foote Jr. must have been a real charmer because he was able to maneuver in white society most of his life. This is Foote's certificate from 1880 election as a town, Falls Church town councilman. In the late 1870s and 1880s, there was a term, a concept called redemption. That was a period of disenfranchisement of African Americans and the erosion of the constitutional rights that uh, were given to African Americans through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. Slide 5 shows a map in 1887 in town of Falls Church showing the gerrymandering and retrocession of one-third of the town from the town to the county. The ideology of redemption continued through the 1890s and into the early 20th century. John Mercer Langston, elected to Congress but not allowed to, by Southern Democrats, to be seated. Plessy versus Ferguson, establishing the separate but equal clause. And then, in 1915, the film the birth of a nation fostered the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in America. In 1915, a segregation ordinance and referendum election ushered in a group of African Americans in Falls Church to gather together and form a group called the Colored Citizens Protective League. They wrote a letter to W.E.B. Du Bois asking to become a branch of the NAACP. The letter that came back from Du Bois' secretary said that there were no rule branches, and that was because you had to have 50 uh, members to sign up in order to form a charter, to create a charter. And they feared for the safety of African Americans. Then in 1918, the bylaws of the NAACP were changed so that there could be a branch in Falls Church signing up 33 members and forming the Falls Church and vicinity NAACP. Although not always successful in resisting Jim Crow policies, the struggle for civil rights in Fairfax County begins here. The next slide uh, will show a uh, 1921 mass meeting. This meeting was about the impending peril of eminent domain and the taking of African-American land to cut a highway to honor General Robert E. Lee, what we know today as Lee Highway. The next slide shows an engineering map to cut Lee Highway in Falls Church, Virginia. Many of the landowners on this map were African-Americans. The downturn in the nation's economy and what we know today as the Great Depression 
in the late 1920s and 30s hit everyone hard, surely. And then there was World War II. With the advent of the Federal New Deal, brought about an expansion of the federal government. Fairfax County was becoming Washington's bedroom community. Land was needed for not only housing, but also roads, areas for commerce, i.e. shopping centers, parks, and schools. In the early 1940s, Fairfax County government evolved to meet these needs. An aggressive planning department created a system of changing zoning of areas to suit its needs for the future. Unfortunately, many African American communities were targeted for that development. This slide here shows the 1937 aerial map of the area known as Seven Corners. What you will see is a progressive using aerial photographs to show how the Frederick Foote family lost their ancestors 40 acres. It also shows where the shopping center, Arlington Boulevard, Eden Center, and an apartment complex to the northeast of the map uh, were also properties that belonged to Fred Foote, who leased that property to the builders of the apartment complex. The next slide shows a 1948 building the exchange at Seven Corners along Route 50. Notice the undeveloped portion where the Seven Corners Shopping Center will eventually be built. This area was lived on by the descendants of Fred Foote. The next slide shows the 1952 article from the Reno Gazette. The judge had ordered the land to be sold and the breaking of Fred Foote's covenant on the deed to forever be held in the Foote family. Notice that the judge sets the property value at $400,000 and appointed two county supervisors to accept bids on the property. The property eventually sold for $750,000. This slide from 1961, an aerial photograph, shows the completed Seven Corner Shopping Center in that very area that was not developed in the 1948 slide. Notice in the bottom left corner a gleaming white structure near the interchange intersection. This is the 19th century home of Fred Foote Sr. Today that is a portion of Coons Fort dealership. The next slide is from the Washington Post and it shows from September 1966 and it speaks to how uh, business was run back in those days as far as the rezoning and the use of eminent domain in order to uh, acquire African-American land in African-American communities. The next slide from April 1967 from the Washington Post regarding convictions Two county supervisors were convicted for taking bribes, and all four of the developers went to jail. I'd like to move on now to a very important topic of school desegregation in Fairfax County. The 1954 landmark decision in the Supreme Court of Brown versus Board of Education was met with massive resistance here in the state of Virginia. The Fairfax County Public Schools were complicit with the state's desire to resist desegregation in its schools. In the struggle for equal opportunities in education, Fairfax County used strategies designed and tested by the NAACP, the national branch. And here locally, Mary Ellen Henderson and Ollie Tenner were a constant fixture at Fairfax County School Board meetings usually asking for better facilities, supplies, books that weren't hand-me-down, and the like. In 1938, they used the Fairfax County Public Schools budget. This analysis of the 1938 school budget showed that white schools received 97.4% of the 1938 budget, while African-American schools received only 2.6% 
of the school budget. The next slide is from the Washington Post entitled, 26 Students Sue Fairfax County Public Schools in Federal Court to End Segregation in Fairfax. And this brought about a federal decision that the plan that Fairfax County had come in up with to integrate one grade per year until kindergarten K through 12 would have been a total of 13 years in order to desegregate. And that was not acceptable. What the NAACP did, they laid out a plan to desegregate the schools by using pupil placement over a five-year period to end segregation in Fairfax County Public Schools. The 1954 landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education is recognized as a victory that helped to send the pendulum of segregation into a decline in our nation. But with the striking down of Article 5 in the Voting Rights Act recently, I think to, uh, in the early 2000s, um, the pendulum seems to be moving back a bit towards the days before Brown and towards the days of Jim Crow. These trends just show how important it is to be forever vigilant and that the struggle for our constitutional rights continue. Our history is our history, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But we cannot afford to sweep what is not to our liking under a literal rug. In my view, we have not done a good job telling the story of enslavement of Jim Crow, segregation in our nation, because it is difficult. The goal is not to blame anyone, but rather to form allyship with whites to dismantle the systems that still exist that perpetuate injustice and inequality in our society. I believe the decision by Fairfax County to embrace the one Fairfax policy is the correct and moral path forward. If policy is guided by considering equality and inclusiveness, then all people and every community are being heard. Let me end with a quote from Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration, where he starts out by saying, history is not history unless it is truth. With malice towards none and charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Henderson. Bravo. Excelente. That was so informative. We learn something new every day, people, don't we? Yes, that's why we're here. It is imperative that we share our African-American history in Fairfax County. It's imperative that we do that. Much of it is not taught in our schools. We have a rich culture that our ancestors work hard to achieve. A lot of our history is in our churches. I will now recognize some of our oldest churches in the community. The Second Baptist Church of Clifton, Virginia, was founded and organized in 1844. With a few faithful members and a small treasury, over 150 years later, they still hold worship services today, honoring their mission to worship God, love people, reach and develop disciples. It sits on a hill in that historic Clifton. The Clifton Primitive Baptist Church is one of the oldest African-American churches in Fairfax County. The roots of this historic church began in 1863 during the Civil War. William Beckwith died and left 200 acres of land and property to his slaves, whom he freed in his will. Just six years later, the former slaves and their children formed the Cub Run Primitive Baptist Church Association. And by 1871, they erected the church we see today. Pleasant Grove Methodist Church was founded by freed slaves. The church was constructed in 1892 on a one-acre parcel in McLean, Virginia. The congregation had previously met in the Audrick's Corner School. 
the church was active until 1967 when it merged with Gunnell's Chapel Methodist Church to form William Waters United Methodist Church. The church building was used for a while by other denominations and later sold. This historic landmark has since been restored by a group of local residents and currently stands as a historic site, museum, and cultural center. These black churches are a significant reminder of the long-standing history of African Americans in Fairfax County. Are you ready for some music? I know I am. Many thanks to the Wrestling Community Center for this next performer, Aquia Aldrich and the Tribe. Born and raised in Washington, D.C., vocalist, percussionist, composer, Aquia attended none other than Howard University, which is an HBCU, where she received a B.A. in Jazz Studies. Inspired by artists such as Nina Simone and Miriam Makiba, Aldrich often infuses her work with elements of African genres and American soul. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Aquia. So this next song is another original of mine. All of these songs are composed by myself. Um, this one is called Standing for Freedom. And it's super important for us to do our part. And this one is near and dear to my heart because uh, one day I just, I woke up with it on my heart. And it was like, you need to stand up and speak, sing your song. And everybody has their, their song to sing, whatever it is, whatever your gift is to share to the world. But most importantly, we have to stand for freedom and for what is right, right now, for the future. I hope you enjoy it. Woke up with a smile on my face and a song in my to be me.
So this next song is an original of mine, um, another original of mine, <laughs> called Red Bark. And um, this song is, is special to me because uh, it is one that I wrote that um, I wrote with my father in mind. And um, the song is in homage to standing at a crossroads. So I call on the energies of the crossroads. And a lot of people know them by different names. Um, in West Africa, uh, they call this energy or this deity Elegba or Tigare, depending on where you are. Um, and everybody has a crossroads that they have to go, go through and decide which way you're going to go. And so we just say prayers to that energy to help us to make the correct decision. And I think it is indicative of these times that we pause and we say a prayer to whomever or whatever it is that you believe in to help you move clearly and intentionally. So I hope you enjoy this song, Red Bark. <laughs> Plante photo, dum dum duri kaswe, dum dum duri kaswe, dum dum duri kaswe, dum dum duri kaswe.
wonderful Aquia. I enjoyed that so much. Wonderful performance. So gifted and talented. Many thanks again to the Reston Community Center and to Aquia, Ulrich, and the tribe for their performance. Traditional and historically in African American communities, the barber shop has been the epicenter of everything from politics to sports. Up next, a story about a community partnership turned initiative between Fairfax County and local barbershops focusing on black health care, mental health, and self-care. Here is the real talk. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of people nowadays get all their information on social media. That's fine. Okay. So they, they listen to whatever social media has to say. So when we when we have, you know, real professionals coming in here and it's actually giving them the truth, it's definitely an eye-opener to them, I believe. I think traditionally barbershops have been like the epicenter of the community. And um, like we like to call it the uh, Black Man's Country Club. So it's always been a place where you can just come and be yourself. And I think that tradition has uh, held has held still until now. A barber is almost, we're like psychiatrists almost. So. You'll be surprised at stuff that people will show. A lot of times your barber is, um, your barber can be your doctor, your barber can be your best friend, your, uh, somebody that you confide in. Um, that you might not be able to take home and confide in. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we touch a broad spectrum of different um, avenues that uh, deal with people. I work for the Fairfax County Health Department. I'm on the Health Department's outreach team, and I conduct outreach specifically in our African American and in our black immigrant populations here in the county. Real Talk actually started in April of 2021, and it started as a need to better reach our black community members. Um, so the barbershop was the perfect place to share information about the COVID-19 vaccine and to also address some of the concerns and mistrust that were circulating out in the community around the vaccine. Well, I know that I'm reaching my target populations when I see them. When I see them in the shop, I'm speaking with them. And also when people are expressing their appreciation for Real Talk and how much they want to continue Real Talk conversations in the barbershop. With, with the community, uh, it's about consistency. So right now we just got them kind of like, hey, that's, that, that's pretty cool. But as it keeps going and going and going, more more people will start to kind of soak into it and, and get more out of it. But we're just now in the beginning phases of it. And, and as we go, the snowball effect is gonna make it bigger. I think it's really important to protect the authenticity and the space that is already happening in the barbershop. So we like to keep the conversations very casual and just let them organically form the way they will. I'm glad Real Talk came into the barbershop. 
Because if you want real talk, you got to come into the barbershop to get the real talk. You can't go into McDonald's. You can't go into 7-Eleven. Uh, you can't go into the schools. Um, you can't do all of that. The barbershop is actually the perfect place for real talk. And, I'm, um, and I was very excited that someone on the outside thought about us. You know, because the barbershop is, the barbershop is like your, uh, your, your, your state Democrats and Republicans. You know, so you, you have everybody in one, and, you know, and that's where you get your good information from, it's in the barbershop. I've had people ask when we're gonna do it again, so I think that um, it definitely touched the community. Like, some people got answers, so they want, you know, to see what's next. Right. Especially when we did the, uh, the mental health one. I don't know how, how y'all's went, but the mental health, like, I, I, I learned some stuff from there that I didn't know about. Oh, definitely, health. I learned a lot, I learned a lot. Yes, Real Talk in 2022 is going to be amazing. In addition to the Real Talk conversations, we're also going to have outreach days where people can come to the shop and be connected to different agencies or organizations. They'll be able to be connected to services and resources on the spot. And also the Bobbers are going to be hosting their first annual community awareness and celebration day. And that's just gonna be a day to bring the different communities from these different shops together to highlight the work that is happening in the black community and to also bring awareness and attention to black mental health, black physical health, and just self-care in general. Unique reflections. Folks can go to each individual barber shop to find out when their next Real Talk or Outreach Day is. You can visit True Reflections Barbershop, you can visit Perfections Barbershop, or you can visit Unique Reflections Barbershop. Oh, that was just wonderful. I can't tell you how much I applaud those men for stepping up and bringing the community together. And Nikki, keep up the good work, girl. For more information about Real Talk, please visit participating barbershops directly for more information. Next, I want to introduce you to two people born and raised along the Route 1 Carter and Gum Springs area. Together with other members of their nonprofit, they are inspiring youth in the area to live their best lives. I give you the Young Highway. Let me say that again, the Young Highway Task Force. Following their interview, we will have a few words by the distinguished lead district supervisor, Rodney Lusk, the first African-American male elected to the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Hi, I'm Nikki Brown, and I would like to introduce to you the founders and CEOs of the Young Highway Task Force, Ms. Ivory Foreman and Mr. Maurice Johnson. It's great to have you here today. Thanks Thank for you, Nikki, me. for having us. I would like to start off with hearing more about you two, and how did the Young Highway Task Force come to be? Well, I'm personally from Gum Springs, Richmond Highway. Um, it's a total of eight of us in the organization, and we're all actually from the Route 1 corridor, all the way from Beacon Hill, Gum Springs, to Buckman Road um, area. And we all was raised in those local areas, went to high school there, and graduated. And we're all out here doing great things, and we just want to give back to our communities because there were people in our communities that gave to us coming up. Yes, we uh, had a call to action. It was a string of violent crimes, particularly gun violence on the Route 1 corridor. So the group of my friends from high school and the community all um, got together right there on the site of the incident. And we formed Young Highway right then and there. And, and I just really love how you guys are from the community that you're serving. So who exactly are you serving? What's the age group that you're serving and the type of activities that you guys are doing out there? Well, we typically serve ages between 10 and 21 years old. Um, we've been doing a lot of community outreach events. We've had events such as washing um, clothing of our families. Um, we've done coat drives. You know, there's a lot going on during this COVID. 
Um, so not only are we individually offering mentorship to the children and the youth, but just also trying to support the families mm -hmm. as best as we can. Yes, yes. Supporting those families is, is very important. And what about your goals for the future? What does the future hold for a Young Highway Task Force? Well, the future holds, uh, we want to go uh, countywide mm -hmm. to reach as much nonprofits and underserved communities as we can. Yes. And we're actually in process of developing a podcast. Something similar to like when we were growing up, we had Teen Summit, Teen right? Nice. Um, yes. And we know that on Route 1 Corridor, a lot of our youth are going through a lot of different challenges right now. And we just want to provide them a safe space, mm -hmm. a non-judgmental place that they can chime in, ask questions, talk about different local events that's going on, and maybe get some mentorship through that avenue as well. Yes, um, that's amazing. I think that's a great idea. Ivory, can you let us know how we can find out more about Young Highway Task Force? Well, you guys are more than welcome to access our website at younghighwaytaskforce.org. Mm -hmm. um, on our website, there's contact information to some of the staff in the organization. And you're more than welcome to send us an email at any time. If you know someone that's in need for services, a lot of us are well-rounded in the county. So we're able to, you know, um, put you where you need to go to seek services and et cetera. So definitely, if you need any information about Young Highway Task Force, please access our website. Absolutely. Well, you guys are definitely doing major things for the community. You guys are true champions. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you Thank for you. having us again, Nikki. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's such an honor to be with you today to celebrate Black History Month. When I think of this month and its significance, I think of our ancestors' legacy of perseverance and what we can learn from it, and the legacy that our generation and this county is laying right now, a legacy that our children will build a future from. That's why I find the theme of today's program so fitting, past, present, and future. Not one of those elements can stand on their own. There's no present independent of our past. There's no possible future independent of the choices and decisions that we make today in our present. That's why we must acknowledge, study, and learn from our past so that we can build a better future. When I think about the past for me personally, I think about the legacy of my own grandparents. I recognize that I stand before you today as the only African American on our board of supervisors, that I stand before you as the first African American man ever elected to the board, and that I stand before you as one of the only African Americans that has ever been elected to represent our county in any capacity. But in truth, I really only stand before you because of them. My grandparents were the embodiment of everything that makes Black History Month worth celebrating. And they instilled in me three important values. If you say you're going to do something, if you make a commitment, then you have to do it. If you live in a community, you have a responsibility to be of service to that community. And finally, if you see someone in need, if you see someone suffering, then you have a responsibility to help them. They didn't just talk about these three values. They lived them every day. And as one of the first African-American families to own a home in Old Town and operate a business, that was not always easy. As I know, it was not easy for many of the ancestors of those participating in this program here today. When I think about our present, I think about the investments that we are making today in traditionally marginalized communities, especially along the historic Richmond Highway Corridor. I think about the vision that Chairman McKay had in acquiring the property necessary to build a first-of-its-kind community center on Route 1, and the work that we have done together to reimagine how such a center can truly serve a community through the development of workforce within that community center. I think about what it will mean to the surrounding community, a largely African-American and Latinx community. 
to be able to gain access to the skilled trades and technology jobs that will allow them to build the generational wealth necessary to shape their children's futures. And overwhelmingly, that's what I think about when I think about the future. The future that our children will inherit. For too long, the future of children growing up in historically African American communities in our county has largely been defined by geography and by the retail and service industry jobs that are too often perceived as the only option to support themselves and their families. The investments that we are making right now will pay dividends of opportunity, equality, and generational progress that will compound far into the future as children, many of them African American, begin to think about their futures differently. The same way that I began to think about my future differently when my grandmother opened my eyes to the world beyond my neighborhood and gave me access to an education that has shaped my life and the lives of my children and their children after them. Those are the legacies that I think about when I think about Black History Month and our past, present, and future. So again, I'd like to thank Chairman McKay for his support and all the other speakers this afternoon for their vision. I know that the legacy that we are building together is something that we'll all be proud of whenever we reflect on Black History Month. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Supervisor Lust, for that uplifting, inspiring message. You are right. Let us all be of service to the community in which we live. And many thanks to Nikki and Ivory Foreman and Maurice Johnson and all members of the Young Highway Task Force. You are doing great work in the community. Keep it up. We need our young people out there and active and involved. Our young people need you, too. Up next, we have a performance by a fantastic band in our area, and I'm sure many of you know, Let It Flow. Their sound is a mix of contemporary jazz, neo-soul, R&B, hip-hop, and old-school grooves. Guessing, no more than emotionally invested, showing you all my imperfections. Yeah, if you let me go, take me for granted. Yeah, if I were more than you could manage, manage. Yeah. Open on me, oh, we can be honest, closer to me, oh, giving me. The whole time, so just careful what you take for granted. Yeah, yeah. If I were more than you could manage, yeah, you can do damage. 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 Come on, y'all. Worry about it, I'm putting pressure. Cut me if I let you No, we ain't doing this just for pleasure Either learn me or I'm a lesson Run on If you want me, don't take me for granted Yeah, yeah, yeah If I were more than you could manage Baby, oh, you're falling for me Oh, baby, I caught it Oh, we can be whatever you want
I want the funky breakdown. Thank you, Maurice Savage, and Let It Flow for that lively, wonderful performance. You can always check them out on their Facebook page and website for more information about future performances. Up next, I pre-recorded an interview with my dear friend, Mr. Anthony Mingo, about an initiative that aims to build capacity and health literacy in black and brown communities called Stronger Square. Anthony, so happy to have you here today with Thank us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get into you letting us know uh, what you do in the health department exactly. What is your role? Yeah, I actually have dual roles with the health department. One, I am the uh, unit manager for the community engagement and outreach team with the health department. But I also serve uh, as the um, project director for a health literacy project called Stronger Squared, that the, the health department uh, won a federal grant, and I serve as project director of that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what does the health department here in Fairfax County and the health literacy grants seek to achieve? What are some of the goals of this program? Yeah, let me start first in, in terms of, of, of giving just a, a, a brief understanding of health literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we saw as a result of, of COVID-19 and the impacts in, in particularly in communities of color and the African American, African immigrant in our Hispanic communities, the, uh, the rise in, in infections, the rise in uh, unfortunately um, uh, the mortality rates of the disease were a direct result of, of um, what we've known for years in communities of color, a lack of understanding how to even to navigate systems. So health literacy is, is an understanding of how to navigate medical systems, how to be in a place of empowerment, that you have a right to take control over your own health decisions. Uh, you have the opportunity and right to uh, ask the appropriate questions. Um, and, 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 and understanding that the importance of that um, relates to the, the level of care that you may or may not receive in, in your current medical situation. Wow, that's really interesting. So what you're saying is, you know, if you don't speak English, you speak some other a language, that it may be difficult when you go to your medical provider to explain to that person just what your health issues are? Absolutely, and, and you also understanding, and, and some of this is generational in nature, mm -hmm. um, not, not understanding that you have the right Right. to question your doctor, That's right. to ask the uh, extra questions, That's to right. insist on the answers that are comfortable for you. That's right. um, so it is a place of, of real empowerment that right. we're in the Stronger Squared project. We're trying to uh, educate individuals in community, but also educate medical providers on how to interact with communities. So it's really a two-pronged approach of one, empowering community through education and understanding of the importance of them understanding how to interact Mm -hmm. uh, with their health care providers and their, their own personal medical situations and what they have a right to have, the information, but also them understanding um, just as importantly that those medical providers should be providing them that information so they can make the best health care decisions for themselves. How do we do that? Is through education, uh, through um, uh, front-facing community partners, but also there's a, the second uh, prong approach is also addressing educating medical providers. Uh, those that um, literally for generations um, will rush, maybe rush people through appointments because of, of healthcare standards or insurance standards. It's, it's allowing healthcare providers to understand from a, a cultural lens, um, culturally and linguistically appropriate lens that how they should interact with community mm -hmm. uh, in such a way that if we are w working with someone as English as a second language, that we need to make sure that we're taking the appropriate time to ask the appropriate questions that they really understand 
what uh, they're trying to convey. And so asking those uh, affirming questions with the patient is really important. So in the Stronger Squared project, uh, we're seeking to educate uh, both community uh, and the medical uh, providers that are working with community. That's a wonderful thing. And I don't know if you've had anything like that here in Fairfax County. So I think you're really tapping into empowering people, as you just said, working not only with adults, but also with youth in our community. And we're targeting people who are at risk Absolutely. from the numbers, you know, the African-American community, the um, Latinx community. So thank you for that work. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. I think that uh, really the credit goes to our, our, our uh, community partners mm -hmm. uh, that are part of the Stronger Squared Project. Um, yes. You know, it's, it's um, um, a, a really a, a, a capacity building, front-facing approach with partners that have already been in community, that are already doing great work in community, many of which were on the front lines during uh, in the beginning of the of the pandemic, and us bringing um, a capacity through training and certification trainings, and other supports, programmatic supports, financial supports, to allow them to not only do the the work that they're doing, but to enhance that work mm -hmm. uh, with the the built assets of understanding health literacy, mm -hmm. and then in using um, their trusted voice. Um, in community to be able to communicate those effective uh, messaging around uh, the importance of health literacy to community. That sounds um, just amazing because people are being certified, they're being trained in these modules to go into these homes or whatever environment they are engaging with people and to have something that they know they can offer, that they feel confident that they can talk to people about issues because I'm sure when they get in, into these homes and engaging with people, you're going to find out that they have many issues, housing issues, maybe food insecurities and the like. So it sounds like this grant is really addressing those things that would really uh, help community. Absolutely. And, and many of those things that you just mentioned are social determinants of health but they relate directly to the long-term health outcomes of the individual. Right. And there's research that actually says that it also relates to the long-term health outcomes of generational impact. Wow, so this is, this is, this is a generational, um, uh, hopefully an, an attempt at improving health care over generations. Thank you. And we're winding down. Yes. We're getting the little flag there. Okay. <laughs> so we could go on forever. But um, quickly, how can people get involved? Well, if, before I get to that, just really quickly, because I think it's really important for folks to understand the, uh, the dynamics of our wonderful team that we've put together. We have faith-based organizations. We have um, African-American um, uh, fraternities and sororities that are doing wonderful work in community. We have medical uh, providers. We have uh, um, um, nonprofits. So I just, it's a culmination of folks. And I just wanted to make sure that I gave the, the uh, appropriate uh, understanding of, of the magnitude of the, the folks that are behind this effort this uh, in community. So it sounds like you've tapped in on the ground, groups that are already working in community, not trying to reinvent anything, because life is about relationships, and you want people who have built those relationships to work with those communities, to people to trust that uh, they have their best interests at heart. So I thank Absolutely. you so much for coming today and sharing all of this information with us. and. Wish you the best of luck with this grant. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much. And, and if folks want to uh, get further information, please have them contact uh, the Fairfax County Health Department. Uh, I'm sure the information will be provided. We'd be glad to talk to individuals and organizations that may be interested in joining uh, the grant. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You so Mingo. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that wonderful presentation and sharing all of that information with the community. I know there will be many individuals and organizations that will be interested in joining that grant opportunity. Earlier in this program, we heard from Mr. Edwin B. Henderson II about African American history and untold stories about heritage in Fairfax County. Our next interview is about the collection of black 
African-American stories in Fairfax County. This is a collaboration between Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, Fairfax County Public Schools, the History Commission and Neighborhood and Community Services. You will hear from Ramona Carroll, who is the program manager with Neighborhood and Community Services. She is also a member of our Black History Committee. And Alicia Hunter, K-12 Social Studies Coordinator with Fairfax County Public Schools. These ladies will be interviewed by Michelle Thompson, nonprofit coordinator with Neighborhood and Community Services, and also a member of the Black History Committee. Following, we will hear a few words from Fairfax County's Chief Equity Officer, Ms. Carla Bruce. The Fairfax County's Black African American Experience Project includes the collecting of Black African American stories, the History Marker Project, and Fairfax County Public Schools History Marker Project-based learning experience. Welcome, Ramona and Alicia. Thank you, Michelle. Happy to be here. Glad to have you. Ramona, let's go ahead and get started. Please share the county's efforts to share the Black African American experience. Thank you, Michelle. I'm really excited to share. Um, the Fairfax County is going to be collecting the personal stories of county residents to increase the visibility of black African American experiences in the county. And we're talking about things like communities, families, education, resistance, justice, innovation, entrepreneurship, anything that's going to really share about lived experiences here in Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for stories from current residents and residents who used to live here. So if you are someone who lives in Fairfax County or you have family members who now have moved away and they would like to share their story, this is the opportunity to share um, our rich storytelling, um, our history, so that we are able to have a full comprehensive view of Fairfax County and the African American, the black and African American experience. Um, we will be collecting these stories ongoing. Um, so hopefully, um, if you haven't already received um, information about how to share your story, mm -hmm. you can definitely email um, Black History Committee at fairfaxcounty.gov for more information, and we will make sure that that information is sent out to you so you're able to share your story. A second way that we are helping to um, elevate the presence or the visibility of African Americans in Fairfax County is through the History Marker um, Project. We're very happy to be working with Fairfax County Public Schools on this initiative um, to get families and communities and students involved in marker submission. So we are looking for, um, and this, this particular project itself will run from February 1st until March 31st, and this is an opportunity for students um, K through 12 in Fairfax County to submit um, suggested submissions for a history marker. Um, and this can be one student um, by themselves, it could be a classroom that decides to um, come together and do this, or it could be a community youth group, so it could be a church group, it could be a Girl Scout troop, mm -hmm. it could be um, a Boy Scout troop, any group that's saying we would like to look more and to um, and to help elevate um, untold stories of African Americans in Fairfax County through a history marker submission um, process. So we will be, again, collecting those submissions from February 1st until March 31st. And at that time, then the um, submissions will be reviewed. And then those who meet the criteria will be forwarded on for um, further consideration by our History Commission. So just really looking forward to having community members really get active and sharing their stories and also thinking about historical um, places, peoples, and, and events that may want to highlight in Fairfax County. And it would be interesting to hear the stories the students come up with about what they suggest. Yes. Thank you so much. Alicia, what, tell us more about the project-based learning experience. Absolutely. FCPS Social Studies is so excited to be a part of this partnership and to support this effort. And so we're starting with the historical marker project-based learning experience that we're inviting all students that reside in Fairfax County to be a part of. We're really excited just to give students an opportunity to think like historians. So mm -hmm. it's no longer just the memorization of dates and events and people, but more so engaging in critical thinking, mm -hmm. inquiry, research, and also evaluating primary and secondary sources. So we were really intentional in using the project-based learning method methodology where students are unpacking a complex problem 
and they're going through a variety of different skills to try to solve that problem. And inquiry is one of the most critical skills as well as critical thinking. So with the project-based learning experience, uh, what we've provided are some resources for teachers to access for classrooms, but also resources that those who are not enrolled in FCPS can have access to. So for anyone enrolled in private school or private schools or teachers that teach in private schools, anyone part of homeschool programs will have access to these resources. So we're really intentional in making sure they were um, developmentally appropriate. So our resources are available for grades four through 12. And so you'll have an opportunity there to, again, maybe at the dinner table, start to have some conversations about mm -hmm. um, history and research and the historical markers. And this is just the beginning of providing these type of opportunities for students. And so I will just say that we're super happy about this opportunity. And we're looking forward to this ongoing um, partnership and making sure we can lift up the stories of all people who are part of the local history here in Fairfax and really excited to kick this off with Black and African American history, um, starting off for Black History Month, but also continuing to lift up the untold stories and to uncover the stories, whether they're oral histories mm -hmm. or histories that just haven't made it to the textbook. So looking forward to it, and again, really happy to be a part of this partnership. Oh, that's so awesome. It sounds like a great opportunity. I think finding the resources is a great motivator to keep continuing to look for more resources. So thank you for making that available for all the students and teachers. Thank you, Ramona and Alicia for sharing the opportunities for the community to engage in and to support the Black African American Experience Project. If you have additional questions or want more information on how to get involved, please look at the information on the screen now, and we look forward to your engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carla Bruce, and I'm privileged to serve this community as Chief Equity Officer for Fairfax County Government. I am honored to join you for this year's Black History Month commemoration. It has been an opportunity for reflecting on and honoring the past and illuminating the challenges we face today. The stories and talents shared demonstrate the perseverance and resilience of Fairfax County's Black community and hopefully have given us the evidence and motivation to envision and work actively toward a brighter, stronger future for Fairfax County's black community and everyone who calls Fairfax County home. As Chief Equity Officer, I've been charged with designing and implementing the strategy to operationalize the county's commitment to advance racial and social equity through the One Fairfax Policy adopted by the Board of Supervisors and School Board in November 2017. With the leadership of the County Executive, my role is to advise and support the Board of Supervisors, County leadership and staff in considering equity in all planning and decision making in order to shape county policy and practice in ways that foster equitable opportunity for all Fairfax County residents. One Fairfax is an acknowledgement by Fairfax County that despite being a great place to live, learn, work, and play, not everyone has shared in the opportunity that has yielded prosperity for so many. One Fairfax is how we think about and approach governance and management of the county. With a One Fairfax focus, we are facing our history and seeking to understand how that history informs the present. We are asking ourselves, are we comfortable with our current social and structural arrangements, or do we desire a future where all in our community have access to the opportunities that will enable them to not just be stable, but to thrive? We are recognizing that an equitable future will require taking bold and innovative action and making equity a priority in the choices we make. Most importantly, one Fairfax leads us to acknowledge government's role in producing and perpetuating inequity with an understanding that government can't dismantle these structural barriers alone. Our work to become One Fairfax must include the meaningful engagement of residents and other community stakeholders. Why? It's those outside of government, you, who can articulate how the doors of opportunity have been opened or closed, 
who can provide a deeper understanding of the drivers and roots of inequity, who can, through engaging with your family and neighbors, shape a shared community value that we all do better when we all do better. With the involvement of the community, we can co-create solutions and cultivate a culture of shared accountability to become one Fairfax. I'm proud to report that this work is already happening. The county is engaging in an extensive effort to capture the experience of African Americans in Fairfax County's history and understand their contributions to the county's success. The county's COVID-19 response in recovery from a public health perspective and an economic perspective has incorporated considerations of equity as evidenced by our vaccine equity strategy and an economic recovery framework that emphasizes a just and resilient recovery. Reflecting the recommendations of Chairman McKay's task force on equity and opportunity, we have convened a team representing county agencies, nonprofits, residents, and community members with a lived experience of poverty to design and pilot a guaranteed income demonstration project, making an investment in addressing the racial wealth gap. The Fairfax County Police Department and Fire and Rescue Department are engaging in implicit bias training and other strategies to improve relationships with the community. The county is pursuing strategies to make housing, both rental and ownership, and childcare, not just affordable, but more attainable. And under the leadership of County Executive Brian Hill, equity is a core element of the county's first ever strategic plan. I so appreciate being included in this year's Black History Program. I was informed and inspired and hope you were too. As we come to a close, I am reminded of the palpable energy that was generated at the unveiling of the James Lee School Historical Marker in October of last year. In my remarks to the group that was gathered, I spoke about the word Sankofa. In the Akan Twi and Fante languages of Ghana, the word translates to retrieve, literally go back and get. San, to return, ko, to go, fa, to fetch, to seek, and take. The Sankofa Adinkara symbol is represented with a stylized bird with its head turned backwards while its feet face forward carrying an egg in its mouth. As descendants of Africa and America, many African Americans have adopted Sankofa symbol to represent the need for us to reflect on the past to build a successful future. Let Black History Month be a reminder to all of us to reflect on the past as we focus on building a successful future. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, so much for those inspiring educational words. You are doing an outstanding job of designing and implementing the strategy to advance Fairfax County's racial and social equity through the one Fairfax policy. And I thank you, Ramona, Alicia, and Michelle. This is a wonderful joint project-based program to help build a racial history timeline and increase the visibility of African-American historical contributions in the county. I cannot believe we are at the end of our program. Where did it go? Well, before we go, you know, we have to thank some people because we're grateful for all the participation, all the work, all the hard work of the committee, all of the people in this, who participated in this program, all of our presenters and performers, our Black History Committee members, and Channel 16 for helping us put this all together. We want to close our program with a performance from the students at Pine Forge Academy singing, There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. God bless all of you. Be safe out there.